Welcome everyone to this masterclass on the Master of Applied Finance. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. Um, I'm Lindsay Bryan. I'm the director of the Applied Finance Centre at Macquarie, and I'm here to host today's proceedings. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, water and community. We pay our respects to them and their culture and elders past, present and emerging. Welcome everyone. Um, and this session today is designed to be interactive. I'd like you to remember that this is actually being recorded. So um, it will be available after the event. Um, and we'd love to see everyone's faces when they're talking because um, it's good to be able to see who's out there and to get a feel for who is involved in this session. Um, I would say though that to enhance the experience for everyone else, everyone has been muted. Uh, please stay muted as that helps avoid background noise from uh, other outside and also prevents things from interrupting the session. Um, I will be on mute myself once I stop speaking and then um, we'll ask the presenters to, uh, to join us. Now our Masterclass presenters will be happy to accept questions throughout. The best way to do that for them is through the chat, but if you'd like to raise your hand, um, it will be monitored um, and you'll be asked to uh, ask your question if there is time to do so. Um, when it comes to the Q&A afterwards, please use the raise your hand uh, function, which is in the participants um, button at the bottom um, and make sure that you do raise your hand and keep it up there because then that gives us the chance to take your question. Um, and then finally, um, there is a live Q&A, as I said at the end, um, that'll give you an opportunity to ask some questions of me, uh, our alumni presenter or the two presenters in the masterclass. So um, I welcome questions at that time. Now, I'd like to give you an update on our course before we get into the masterclass. Um, and we have done some significant reworking of um, our three courses. Um, they do all link together. So the Graduate Certificate of Finance, Graduate Diploma and Master of Applied Finance all form part of the Master of Applied Finance. So we often talk about all three at the same time, but they often do have different um, purposes, but that's okay. We'll get through a little bit about how that works in the next slide. Um, you can track the journey you are going to take as a student throughout um, the Master of Applied Finance through this slide here. Now you can see on the left that the people taking this course tend to be either from a non-finance background where they require those finance skills and knowledge, or they might be finance workers who want to learn specific practical details in the industry that they currently work, or they might be financial professionals who want to move to other more senior roles and see this as a way to broaden their knowledge and to move on to the next level. And there are plenty of examples of CEOs currently in the market who have done this and actually have got to where they've got through, among other things, doing the Master of Applied Finance. Now, we normally operate these masterclasses as a way to give people information about how the course works. Um, and this works very effectively. We wanna make sure that people have the information they need. We also get referrals. So existing students and alumni will refer other people to the course. And we also get people who just are interested directly in the course. And we now have introduced another um, opportunity for people to get involved, which is AFMA Financial Market Certificate. That enables people who are AFMA accredited dealers uh, in the new program to then move on to doing the Master of Applied Finance if it suits them. And so these people all end up in either a graduate certificate of finance, the graduate diploma of applied finance or the master of applied finance. And it, once you're in the course, you actually get access to a number of seminars such as this. Um, you also get the chance to network with alumni like Balaji, who is going to present later. Um, and we have sessions where everyone can talk about their experiences, what they've learned and where they've gone. Then we also have LinkedIn groups, which enable people to get together and discuss issues and also to get to know other people. Now, once you have finished your um, degree, that's not the end of it because there is continuing professional de development, exec ed and tailored training, which is offered and there are discounts offered to our alumni. The seminars continue, the ones that we put on, the ones that alumni put on and the ones that the business school as a whole puts on. And then there is also alumni events and, and networking and there are LinkedIn groups for alumni as well. So there's a, a broad range of interactions that are part of this journey. Then there's this opportunity to continue learning and to network across your peers. Now, one of the things that we have done with 
the, um, up the degrees and the courses is to ensure that if we're going beyond just giving technical information, it's not just about tools and techniques. We want you to be able to apply those tools and techniques to real situations. So we emphasize critical analysis, we emphasize communication, and we also emphasize application. One of the things we are doing now to bring um, the course more up to date is to uh, address environmental, social, and governance issues more comprehensively throughout the course, and also to have uh, particular subjects where this is covered in a little bit more detail. So the practical outcome here is that we, through doing this course, we can help you to get where you want to be. If you want to be the next Elizabeth Gaines or Rob Scott, um, who are the CEOs of Fortescue and West Farmers respectively, then this is a course that can help you get there. Equally, there's a number of people who um, have done this course in other jurisdictions and other areas um, where they've added this in to make sure that they are ready to finance their businesses. So this is a, a wide ranging um, application that you can put our course to. So when we put this, that made the changes to the course, my apologies, um, we wanted to make sure that um, we're meeting people's needs today. We were once 100% face-to-face for all classes. Um, and then in 2020, we went 100% online. Um, now what we want to do, and we're doing in 2021, is to have a blend of both so that there is online and face-to-face -face with the option of online if you are unable to make the face-to-face. -face. This is to make this a truly blended course and to actually give people the opportunity to interact even if they're not in Sydney or Melbourne. Um, now, when, one of the other things we wanted to do is to make sure that we built on those industry accreditation pathways. So we wanted to make sure that people who had come to us from an industry association or from another area, such as the AFMA dealer accreditation, have opportunities to get into the Master of Applied Finance and to get some benefit from having that accreditation. The assessments that we built into this are designed to be relevant to your working life. They're practice-based assessments. It is no longer the case where we will just do a recall exam. We want people to be able to apply their um, knowledge to a real life situation. And one of the other things we're doing is to combine academic and industry practitioners. We get the best of the both worlds. So in this situation, we've got the masterclass here today. Marcus is an industry practitioner, Guy is an academic. They both came together to present um, a private equity course, and they're doing that again today. And one of the other things we wanted to do was to make the unit structure easier to understand and make it a little bit more up to date. And I'll talk a little bit more about that now. In making the structure simple, we just wanted to have very, very simple um, means of, of getting people through the degree. So four foundation units, four core um, essential units, and everyone does four electives. Makes it very easy, it's easy to remember. The foundation units um, actually make up the graduate certificate of finance. If you do the foundation units plus four um, cores and electives, you get to do the graduate diploma. And if you do the foundation plus all eight core units, that's the master of applied finance. And one of the key things that we do allow is recognition of prior learning. In most cases where someone has done a finance degree, they won't need to do those foundation units. Equally, that means that if you are entering into the, um, the graduate diploma of finance, you may only have to do four units to get that. Um, and then if you're doing the master of applied finance, you may only need to do eight units. So we're trying to make it simple and easy for people to understand. The other thing we do is to make sure that the electives we offer are designed to meet one or more role profiles. So whether you want to work in corporate treasury, business or project valuation, funds management, superannuation or wealth management, we have a course that is designed to suit you. We have electives that match that requirement. And even if we can't um, give you exactly what we want, we can generally find an elective and we use um, some of the electives from the MBA to widen the participation beyond just pure finance. So some of those units at the moment are shown in this page here with the unit structure. The four foundation units are taken completely online whereas the, um, the core essential units and the core elective units are generally run as a combination of online and face-to-face -face sessions. And those face-to-face -face sessions have the option of being done online as well. So it's not the requirement that people be 
actually in Sydney, they can join into those, um, those classes on the weekends from their home via Zoom. We have a number of new units involved. The one that we are talking about here is the one called Private Capital, which you can see down there on the right. Um, and it is an amalgam of a couple of other units uh, and to widen it to cover what the universe of private capital looks like these days. Um, we're also bringing in a new unit called Sustainable Finance, so we can address some of those ESG issues more directly and how they affect finance going forward. Okay. Um, and finally, the one thing we want to do is to make sure that our students have a great experience. So um, whether you are there in person or learning online, you will interact with others and we want to encourage that. Our units all commence now in week one and run for 10 weeks with blended learning. There are generally in each term two weekends uh, when classes are run either face-to-face -face or online. Um, and they will, all those interactive sessions are always gonna be in the evenings and on weekends to ensure that the courses are work friendly. Those weekends are all about application. So now what I'd like to do is to introduce um, Guy and Marcus. Guy Schofield um, is from Macquarie Business School. He is an academic who has worked in this area for some time. And Marcus uh, Simpson is actually calling in from Queensland. And he is actually a, a practitioner in the private equity side and has had a lot of experience through various um, entities throughout that time. Gentlemen, I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Excellent, and I hope that you can hear us. Uh, and, and thanks Guy for uh, participating and for helping out as well, and Lindsay for the introduction. So in today's masterclass, we have half an hour, and what we're going to talk about is superannuation funds and private capital and what's happening in that area. We'll start off with superannuation funds, uh, focusing on Australian ones, talk about what's driving their actions, and then describe private capital, how that's accessed and why. A new trend, uh, which is superannuation funds seeking to invest directly into private capital, and then a short summary. And please post questions using the chat function. We'll have a brief uh, stop for a question after each topic, uh, and then uh, we'll move on. Uh, we will barely scratch the surface of what's covered in the Master of Applied Finance course that Lindsay just introduced. And in that, there's a lot more detail about how these companies are bought, valued, uh, returns are generated, and a lot of case studies. So we'll move to the next slide, please. So superannuation or pension funds are really the providers of private capital. It's actually interesting that we have Balaji speaking um, after this because as he works with Vanguard, they're one of the large organizations trying to disrupt what has been that historic provision of superannuation pension fund provisioners of private capital. So if you look at Australia, it's a very interesting market because we actually have the fourth largest pension market globally. And it's growing very quickly because as we all know, there's a 9% contribution rate that in itself is growing to larger numbers. The industry funds are growing rapidly, particularly in the last couple of years, driven by a number of factors, including fund consolidation. If you actually look on the right-hand side, which is just a sample of some of the larger funds, Aware Super um, last year was itself through a fund consolidation. Uh, Q Super is in discussions with uh, Sun Super that's been going on for a while. And last week, um, Host Plus announced that it was merging with Maritime Super. So it's an industry that itself is seeing a lot of change uh, and a lot of growth. And what we'll talk about in a little bit more uh, detail is their allocation to private markets. Just a, a definitional aspect. So private markets comprises private equity, private debt, private real estate, natural resources and infrastructure. What we've really focused on is private equity and infrastructure. And you'll see large allocations to infrastructure and also um, allocations to private equity. It's very different in the larger markets. Uh, the USA uh, American uh, superannuation market is 15 times the size of Australia's. 
uh, and we see larger private equity allocations and smaller infrastructure allocations. Uh, just a couple of examples, Yale University, its private equity allocation, which includes venture capital, is at 37% of assets. Uh, one of the places I worked in the past, Virginia Retirement System, has a 14% allocation to private equity. Uh, next play page, please, Guy. We switch back to the Australian market. I think it's really important when you look at institutions to understand what's driving their activities. So in the Australian market, we have APRA, who is the regulator. And APRA is the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority. Amongst other things, it is focusing on returns, what returns are members getting as they commit to um, products that are managed by superannuation funds. There is a focus on cost uh, and a desire to have uh, 50 percent, so 50 basis points, so half a percent investment cost. And so that's something that infects what the superannuation funds are doing. The other is investment beliefs, also um, important and often driven by the chief investment officer of those funds and who that fund is. So UniSuper, which is where um, anybody who works for Macquarie University probably has their super, uh, that fund is, is managed by its CIO and very successfully with a focus on public market investing. CBUS, uh, for example, is uh, becoming very involved in direct real estate investing. And then that also ties over to what capabilities. So as a superannuation fund, what capabilities do you have? What teams are you able to build in-house? And as these superannuation funds get bigger, they're able to take more capital in-house. A really important factor also is both returns, but also investing well, doing the right thing, and having a great member experience. So you will see now, for example, um, I'm a Q super member, and they just produced an app last year. So easier usage for members and a greater focus on ESG investing. So net net, if you're looking at activities of these big Australian superannuation funds, I would focus on and what's important to them is returns. As a member, what returns are you going to get? What is the cost of those returns? And then uh, what is the engagement with members? So Guy, have you been um, watching the chat? Maybe we have time for a question now, please. Yeah, I think, um, Jim, watching the chat, one of the questions which I think comes up, and it's a question from me, is just, you touched on uh, the focus or the factors for Australian super funds. You know, who are the, what, what's the core factor for Australian super funds when they're thinking about the benefits? Who, who should benefit from their work? Is it all Australians? Well, I think as members, and I would suspect that everybody on this call is a member of an Australian superannuation fund, what we want to have is we want to have enough money to uh, pursue our wishes in retirement. It is predominantly, and Future Fund is probably the one exception um, of the list that's up here, it's a defined contribution fund system. So we both retire with our individual balances, which is very different to the US system that is a defined benefit fund. So I think that uh, in Australia, we want two things. We want predominantly to have a really good retirement. All things being equal, we probably also want Australia to benefit. So if there are really good infrastructure projects in Australia, I think we'd rather see investments in those projects as opposed to an equally beneficial project elsewhere in the world. But that's a debate that you find picked up in uh, a number of the activities of the pension plans. Okay. Um, we've got another question here on from Hamid, but I think I might hold that to later on because it talks about to direct investing. So let's, let's pick that one up, Hamid, later on. Perfect, sounds good. Okay, let's talk a bit about uh, private capital which tends to get a greater share of press than the amount of private capitalists out there. So just taking a brief uh, step back, if you look at the total global capital market size of about $660 trillion, the alternative investments of which private capital is a part is really only about 9 trillion of that 660 trillion. 
And that market is dominated by real estate, debt, cash, uh, and the public stock markets are large, but they're only 90 trillion. So let's keep that in perspective. And then we'll briefly on the next slide, please, Guy, deal into alternative assets. And what we're really gonna focus on is within that, the private markets. So private markets are investment into private companies, and hence they're companies that you can't go to the back of the Fin Review or the back of the Financial Times and look up their current stock price. Within private markets in the area that we'll focus on is private equity, which is about 3.4 trillion in total. And then also infrastructure, which is very big in Australia, but globally uh, is about half a trillion dollars in total. And the way superannuation funds accesses this private opportunity is typically by investment managers. Within the private equity universe, there's about 8,000 private equity managers globally, pursuing strategy ranging from buyouts of more mature companies to venture investing, investing in startup companies, uh, and then growth um, investments, which sort of fall in between those two categories. Some of these managers have been so successful that they are by invitation only. Uh, and there was one manager that after 10 years of begging to be let in, uh, we were able to get access to, but then actually they made a really meaningful contribution to returns. So next slide, please, Guy. So then why would you invest in private markets? Well, I think on the positive side, there is, and we'll have a couple of slides on this, a real ability to be able to generate alpha, to be able to generate returns. This is largely done by active management, being able to buy, buy these private equity, private companies very well, to be able to use a lot of operational expertise to build these companies, and then to be able to sell them through very efficient processes. Typically on the private equity side, within about four to six years after you buy them, it's much longer in infrastructure. Alignment is important. So private equity managers, uh, if they do well, they will actually receive 20% of the investment gains. And similarly, the management teams of the portfolio companies can also do very well uh, through capital gains also. It also enables you to gain different types of exposures. Uh, so through programs um, that I've been involved with and run, we, for example, had exposure to WhatsApp, uh, to Alibaba, to Facebook, when they were much smaller private companies. And if you invest in the emerging markets, you can get access to growing consumer-driven businesses. Whereas if you look at the public markets and emerging markets, a lot of that uh, exposure is large energy and banks, for example. However, it's not all rosy and, and there are cons, one of which is cost. So it can be um, a lot more expensive to invest this way. Private equity fund investing, which is the most common route, probably costs about 6% per annum. They are a liquid, so it's, you are investing through private partnerships, which are hard to sell, although that is changing recently. Through these blind pools of capital, you are making a commitment often to a manager who will manage your money and will invest in companies that you don't know what they are today. And they will invest your capital over a investment period in private equity, three to six years time, and then volatility. So the good ones do really well. Uh, the ones who are not so good, uh, you can underperform a similar benchmark. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Next slide, please, Guy. Just about May, from a researcher's perspective on private equity, we've often found it very difficult to get access to information. And so trans transparency and information on uh, private markets has been rather tricky. Do you see that's changing? I think that there is more transparency, um, but I think ultimately in terms of being able to have up-to-date transparency to do academic studies, I think those data sets are still increasingly hard to obtain, but are improving. And the markets are changing very quickly as well. Okay. So uh, in terms of why invest, uh, this is a quite complicated chart, but it's the one that I like to use because from KKR's economics unit run by Henry McVeigh, and they're the only group that I know 
by asset class have past returns and forward returns. So the dotted line is a marker which efficient frontier. And if you don't know what that is, we'll teach you at the uh, Applied Finance Center of past returns. And then the solid line is expected returns. So they are expecting collectively returns to come down. If you look at private equity, it is potentially the most attractive on a risk return basis. So expected returns of around 10%. And uh, sort of middle of the of the uh, market um, volatility. What's interesting is their expectations for public returns going forward are actually quite low compared to where they have been histor historically. So private equity in the past has been an outperformer, and certainly infrastructure, real estate, other private asset classes have done really well. So that's a reason for investing. Next slide. And within that, there are at size rewards for good execution. So this shows based on uh, individual funds, both for global equities funds, the so stock, mar stock market managers, bonds, uh, long only hedge funds, and then on the right is private equity and venture capital. If you do well, you can really outperform a median return. So if you look, if you do a really good global equities fund, you might have in the past earned about 11, 12%. Really good portfolio of private equity and venture capital, you can be up in the low 20s. Uh, the portfolio that I managed most recently, we were up in the mid 20s returns. So that makes a real difference to your first question, Guy, about can you make a better life for retirees when they're actually in that retirement mode? Private equity done well, yes done badly, you can detract from that. And on this slide, um, I'll just run through this quickly. It's just a, a, on, on the next slide, please, Guy, uh, slide 12. Quite a complicated slide. I sort of highlighted two things that we focused on. One is you know, how investors gain these, uh, this exposure. So here, an investor pension superannuation fund will uh, invest in a fund, for example, raised by KKR, they will get other investors into that fund and they will buy individual portfolio companies. So that sort of uh, highlight on the left is what we're talking about. In the next section, we'll talk a bit about this new evolution of investors directly investing into companies. I've named uh, just a very few of these 8,000 managers. So Quadrant Private Equity, very, good and well-respected manager based out of Sydney, a uh, big new firm, Ben Gray, uh, and his team, uh, BGH. Uh, they've interestingly been partnering with Australian Super on a lot of active uh, investments recently. KKR, the original barbarians at the gate. Um, Audax Group, a very good specialized uh, manager that we've used in the US. And Sequoia Capital, who famously backed Apple, Google, WhatsApp, uh, number of uh, venture businesses. So do we have a, a, a good question we might be able to ask, Guy, something come in? Uh, yeah, so let me um, ask um, Hamid to unmute his uh, microphone and just ask his question, which is posted on the chat. We Have we got Hamid still there? Yes, thank you for unmuting me. So, Marcus, the question I have is, you mentioned earlier on that more and more private capital is being allocated in-house at the super funds. What is your comment on the state of this transition? How far is the transition ahead in Australia? And are you seeing more and more funds put together teams specifically for private equity and private credit investments? A very good question. I think there is a quite a large diversion in terms of approach that super funds are taking. Certainly many of them are trying to, across all assets, internalize what they can. They find it easier to internalize public market investing, cash management, bond investing. Private equity is probably one of the last areas to be um, insourced. Some of them say we will always rely on managers. But there is a subset, and particularly amongst those sort of large names uh, that we had on that chart of superannuation funds, who are trying to do what they can, mindful of the risks, to internalize private equity. Okay. 
Okay, I think that we have got, that's the, the um, question we've got. Shall we go on to the next slide, Marcus? Yes, uh, so the next slide really, we probably won't cover, but it's just more detail on how uh, funds are currently investing. And it shows this management fee paid to general partners and then uh, with a hurdle, 20% of gains uh, going to the managers and 80% back to the, uh, to the investors. And I think as we've got about uh, six or seven minutes left, we'll just focus on uh, this evolution and then we'll, we'll wrap up. And uh, one thing that we have noticed, uh, particularly in Australia in the last year, but it's been prevalent in other markets for quite a period of time, has been super funds investing direct. Uh, so in May last year, and actually um, Guy and I talked and uh, use this as a case study on this in the last elective that we taught, uh, Virgin was in play. Um, Australian Super um, ponied up with BGH for a bit, and then QIC was very involved in investing in Virgin and seeking to keep Virgin in Queensland, and ultimately it partnered with uh, Bain Capital to, um, to close that transaction. Uh, First State Super more recently bid for uh, Opticom, which is a fiber, net fiber network provider. Uh, and then um, Australian Super bid uh, uh, 5 billion for a clean energy investor, Infratil. That interesting was already owned by an infrastructure manager, but he was seeking to go direct. So we see this in the press. Uh, when we teach our classes, we do try and bring a lot of what's currently happening, happening into the classroom. And certainly uh, these will be good, good fodder for uh, our next case studies, Guy. Yep, indeed, indeed. Um, we've got a question from um, Pavel, uh, which I might just ask him to, um, to, 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 to shout out. So, hey, are you able to unmute yourself, Pavel? Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, on the direct investment in the private companies, uh, the question is, uh, are you looking for the, uh, funds looking for investment in the pre-IPO stage companies or early stage companies? Oh, well, that's a very good uh, question. I think that there are, there are a number of, of aspects. So one is um, risk. So I think if you're going direct, it's a larger exposure. And also you need to watch how operationally intensive it is. So I think they tend to choose more mature later stage companies and companies where there's a good management team in place or it's a inherent model like a, a toll road, for example, that doesn't require as much change or active management as an investment in a startup, for example. And we've covered that's a great segue to the, to the next slide, Guy, uh, which you have up, which is kind of the pros and cons of direct investing. So I think, you know, you do get fee savings because you're going direct. You do get bigger exposures. So for example, when um, First State Super was bidding for uh, Opticom, that was a $675 million transaction. Uh, so we'd be able to get a much larger exposure to that business than if it had bought uh, through a manager where it's just one investor in a fund. And it does enable, and we've seen a lot more of this sort of novel strategies. So because of the shorter duration of private equity funds, which tend to have a 10 year life, they can only hold companies for four to six years. And so if you're able to find a private company uh, where there's an opportunity to hold it for much longer, it's actually hard for private equity firms often to uh, compete with that. There are a number of risks. So particularly if you got it wrong and your first company that you invested in in a brand new direct investment strategy went belly up very quickly, then that's not very good for your career as somebody who's worked for uh, a superannuation fund or, or, or good for that program. And similarly publicity on the previous slide, you know, we saw a nice kind of fin review article, uh, you know, Ian Silk kind of in the press as well. You know, I think a number of, of funds just don't want the publicity that comes with uh, going direct. And what happens if a company needs restructuring, you have to lay off, for example, 
um, a lot of uh, employees. There's, there's a lot of adverse publicity. Um, and finally, it is uh, very resource intensive. So while uh, companies are, sorry, superannuation funds are growing internal teams, often the managers often have much larger teams. So I talked about the Audax Group. Uh, they are a specialist in buying uh, platform companies and then doing add-on investments. Uh, they have over 100 plus investment professionals and they have a lot of experience where they've done over the years, 135 platform companies, and then they've uh, added and integrated 900 acquisitions. So that's a type of skill set that you can access if you use a manager, as opposed to trying to build that kind of skill set in-house. This is very much a evolving strategy. Uh, Today, activity really has focus in terms of superannuation funds going direct on infrastructure investments, but we will see more focus on uh, operationally intense uh, businesses, sometimes alongside a manager uh, and sometimes directly. So I think, Guy, in the interest of time, can we just skip to slide 18, please? And then we'll just uh, wrap up and uh, then we'll have room for a couple more questions afterwards. So I think what we see, if we look at uh, superannuation funds and private markets within an Australian context, that Australian, super, uh, Australian superannuation funds are very comfortable with real estate and infrastructure investing. In fact, infrastructure investing was invented in Australia and some of the most active uh, managers overseas like IFM and Macquarie buying assets in Europe and in the US are actually Australian. There has been a mixed experience in private equity. Certainly, um, there was a lot of frustration with private equity programs that were built 10 to 15 years ago, but that, that is changing now. Uh, and a number of programs are being built and a number have been very successful. Um, for example, Future Fund has built a, an amazing program. Very important to understand in the Australian context that as a superannuation fund, particularly a defined contribution plan, which is the majority of the plans, that because they have an overall investment budget of 50 basis points, if you just built a portfolio of private equity funds and you had a 5% allocation to these funds, that would cost 30 basis points at a funds level. So if you just had a private equity allocation of 5%, you've used almost an over half your investment budget. That is part of the reason why you see an Australian superannuation funds going direct and using different strategies. And then in context of this provision of capital, you know, we're seeing a lot of difference in investment strategies we touched on that. These bigger funds, because they're bigger, you multiply that 50 basis points and what they're using internally on these bigger numbers, they were able to take more resources in-house. And compensation is improving at these superannuation funds, but still lags manager compensation, particularly the more successful managers. And we're also seeing superannuation funds opening overseas offices, particularly in Europe and in the US, in part to give them greater access to direct investing. So I think that uh, private markets has worked really well for superannuation funds globally and pension funds globally. I think it's evolving and accelerating here. And I think in terms of some of the innovation in investing, I think because of the market um, dynamics here, we will see some greater innovation in Australia. So with that, just go to the last slide, please, Guy. Uh, certainly, we thank you for your time and attention. I hope you get a taste of what we cover when we teach at the uh, business school. And how are we doing on time, Guy? Do we have room for a question or two? I think we can squeeze um, no more than two questions in. So if I, I'll shoot one, one here from Monica, um, who asks about a question of allocations to geographic markets. So. Uh, how are they set and, and will um, the US remain the largest market focus for allocations? So I'll make a distinction here. So I think, Monica, your question is about superannuation funds and where they are investing. So if you actually look at the private equity market, 
in terms of total investable opportunities, 2% of that is in Australia and over 50% of that is in the US. So for the vast majority of superannuation funds, most of the capital will be in the US. Uh, for the program that we most recently run, we did have an overweight, so we had about 10% in Australia, so we found some really good opportunities there. And then the largest uh, exposure was in the US, followed by uh, Asia, uh, and then followed by Europe. Thanks, Marcus. So the last question I'm going to um, pick up um, is one which is um, probably in many people's mind, which is, how do you break into the industry? <laughs> uh, that is a really, really good question. And actually, um, I was having uh, coffee with somebody yesterday who was, who was seeking to break into the industry. The good news is that it is one of the most rapidly growing industries. And even these superannuation funds, as they internalize, you will see larger teams. So there's an opportunity to go and work for them. The typical way of accessing the industry is to um, work for an investment bank, a consulting firm, an accounting house uh, to leverage. Often they have a really good training program to work on transactions as a investment banker or a banker or a accountant and get noticed by the private equity houses. If, if that's the route you want to go, you want to go work for a private equity manager. Slightly different on the venture capital side where actually they prefer more operational experience. So hopefully you've had a successful startup, you've sold it. Uh, and that would be a great kind of calling card, or maybe you even know a venture manager. Uh, I think for the superannuation funds, we like to hire people that had uh, two to three years of experience out of the workplace or had an undergraduate degree, a couple of years experience, and then would be fresh out of a program like uh, the one that Lindsay uh, just presented at Macquarie University. All right, Marcus, I think that um, pretty much leaves us out of time. Um, I'm going to um, stop sharing and, and hand back. Thank you, Guy. Thank, Thank you, Marcus. Um, that's fantastic. And, um, and remember, everyone, um, we do have an opportunity for further questions uh, a little bit later. What I would like to do now is to introduce our um, uh, alumni speaker, Balaji Gobal. Uh, he is the head of private investor at Vanguard Australia. So Balaji, I'll hope, hopefully you are able to unmute and talk to us now. Um, let, let me know if you can hear me. Can Sounds hear me? good. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you, Marcus, for also um, a fantastic presentation. Um, it, it brought back uh, a lot of memories from when I did my course. But first of all, thank you, thank you all for having me. Yeah, it's great to back, great to be back here talking to you after uh, after a after a long time, after a few years since I've um, completed my master's course. Um, I started my course in 2011, and I uh, and I took three years to complete it. I graduated in 2014, so. Uh, it was, um, it was a fascinating journey, not just because of the course, but also because of a number of um, life events that happened. Um, like most of you uh, who are considering or contemplating the course, um, you will have to just balance this with um, your day job as well as other things that happen in your life. And um, in my case, it was, um, I had two children right in the middle of, um, middle of the course. And they say, if you want something done, give it to a busy person. So um, I, I think that certainly played in, um, played through in my case and uh, and also I, I find that it's not just um, me and my mentors and other friends who help you get through the course it's also your family and everyone because it is a it is a time commitment but um, I um, when I started this course I found it harder than what I initially anticipated but I um, I was able to benefit from um, from the rewards once once I finished and and I'll talk through um, some some practical examples of how I um, you know, how I began, uh, how I got to the point of choosing to do the master's course and, and, um, and how it helped me in my career um, to the extent it, um, it helps you. But before that, just a, a little bit about my professional background. Um, and I'll talk a, a little bit about the two, two predominant experiences that I've had just to give you greater context as I talk through some of the examples. 
Right now I work for um, Vanguard. Vanguard, for those who don't know, is one of the world's largest investment um, and wealth management organizations. Um, we pioneered the first index fund in the world um, and also pioneered low cost investing um, around the world. And our, that was fundamentally driven by the belief that um, you, know, you shouldn't have to pay too much um, by way of costs when you're investing because the, 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 the lower you pay, the, the more you keep and the, and the better your investment outcomes. It's about as simple as that. From those humble beginnings, we've, um, we've now grown to about 9 trillion Australian dollars and um, predominant a big chunk of that coming from the US. Um, and in Australia, we're uh, about 150 odd billion dollars. We, um, we're also, we also recently um, announced and Mark has touched on it, is our plans to um, go direct to the Australian um, direct investor market, which is fundamentally where, what um, Vanguard's um, uh, core strategy lies. We service about, we serve about 30 million clients around the world. And um, in, from an Australian standpoint, we really want to take investing to, um, to direct investors to really make it less daunting and to just improve investment outcomes for, for most of our investors. Um, prior to my current role, I worked as head of product and strategy uh, at Vanguard. So the role there was to build um, investment products um, um, right from scratch through to implementing these products and, and seeing, them, um, seeing them succeed. And this was for all kinds of investors, whether you're a retail investor or an advisor or a very large institutional investor. Before, before Vanguard, I worked at ANZ. I started off in the private bank there, um, building products and platforms, but also, and then moved into um, a chief investment office, which was part of the wealth management function, which served essentially as a one kitchen that serviced many restaurants. Um, so we managed money for retail investors, super, super ANZ, superannuation business, high net worth, and, and, and all, all sorts of other businesses. So that, that's kind of my background. I'll talk through some of the, um, um, some of the practical examples of how, um, so how the courses helped me. My background prior to doing the um, master's course was predominantly in management consulting strategy and technology. Um, a lot of it was working with businesses to um, you know, understand the business strategy, help them articulate it, um, and then go about trying to create a delivery roadmap to try and implement it. I always had an interest in um, working in finance, in finance, financial services, and the particular bent towards investing. I found myself quite fortunately in a spot with an ANZ where we were managing money for um, our private um, private bank customers, as well as some very um, um, with a lot of charities and bequests that um, people would leave money to, and that needed to be managed in a certain way. Um, a lot of it was uh, managed not in a massively return seeking way, but it was um, with, a, with a heavier bent towards capital preservation and to just provide some growth, but not, not um, growth at, at all costs. It was, it was fairly considered and somewhat of a conservative investing stance. So that um, I, I wanted to be in that space. I wanted to do a lot more, but fundamentally I, um, from a career standpoint, it was important to me to figure out what I wanted to be, but more importantly, what I didn't want to be. And early in my career, I made the decision that I didn't want to be an investment manager and I loved to be in the business of investing. And that was important to me. And um, that's, that's kind of um, the journey I took. And, um, you know, the masters um, definitely helped me. It helped me not becoming the best investment analyst that I could ever be, but fundamentally for what I wanted to do, it really helped give me a lot more context into how investing works, how markets work, how geographies, how economies work. And most importantly, it gave me the necessary tools and the frameworks to be able to connect these dots. But fundamentally, um, it gave me the confidence to be able to ask questions, um, have the right answers, um, or, or even, you know, be able to think better, which, which, which I think was um, fundamentally invaluable. Some of the, um, um, some examples while I'll um, talk to you about is, um, Marcus spoke about in a superannuation context, you, uh, we needed to draft investment belief. One of the first um, things that I did at ANZ was to come up with an investment philosophy and, um, and also investment beliefs. And it's a great process to go through because you always assume that everybody is um, thinking about the same thing in the same way as you are. Um, but once you draft something and have a discussion and a debate about it, 
um, you suddenly find out how people could be at polar ends of, um, of the same discussion, despite being in the same organization. I particularly found the foundational units within the master's course of investments really put me in good stead to have these discussions and also the risk and portfolio construction elective, um, which um, was there at the time. It, it, um, I didn't need to, to, to have all the answers, but to be able to ask the questions and, and bring people together, that was um, pretty invaluable. Um, with an ANZ, we, um, we also managed a lot of monies for, um, for, for, the, for a life company with an ANZ. So ANZ has a lender's mortgage insurance. It also had an insurance business and we would manage pools of capital for this. And the minute you talk about insurance, you're suddenly talking about balance sheets and risk management, and it gets into this new realm of complexity that um, normal humans shouldn't have to deal with. Um, I, um, I, I found the financial risk management course, which was one of the hardest, but also the most rewarding course um, in the master's program that really helped me prepare for it. And I still think one of the best moments of that time was having a discussion with the ANZ treasurer who'd been doing that kind of work for 20 years as well as one of the directors of, um, of our insurance boards, um, who was a deputy chairman of APRA, and he was, an, he, was a, he was a career actuary, to be able to sit down and have conversations. Um, I mean, these guys were absolute specialists, but I was able to just at least contextually talk about how the machine works and, and articulate our thinking, which was, which was great. And um, you know, that's, that's a great benefit from, um, that I derived from the course. The other things, um, I, um, I, at Vanguard, Vanguard prides itself on, um, we, we, we ask uh, our staff whom we call crew to have a very strong investment acumen. We want people to understand um, because we were fundamentally an investment firm and we wanted people to understand investments. There's a lot of, um, there's a, there's a lot of um, focus on people doing CFAs, but, um, but fundamentally what we want people to do is understand how investing works so that we can relate it in the context of whether we launch products or whether we launch um, um, any tools and frameworks that, that help people want to invest in products. Um, Vanguard um, takes product development very seriously. It's one of the oldest functions um, there. Every product that we launched in my prior role would go to a global investment committee chaired by our CEO, who um, was incredibly smart. He was the CIO um, for Vanguard beforehand. And um, it's one of those things. And maybe part of, part of it was um, the American culture where you, 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 everyone's meant to know a lot about what you're bringing. And certainly when you're, when you're um, senior enough, you're expected to know and um, to think through things. So I, I felt um, the master's course really equipped me um, to really over time to build on my experience to be able to have these conversations and not be daunted by any question that people come through. And the best way to prepare for these things was to really have a number of debates and um, the tools that I learned in the master's course was, um, were really helpful. So as, as we, um, Marcus touched on the fact that Vanguard is moving into a superannuation domain, the industry, the financial industry is also rapidly changing and evolving, particularly post the Royal Commission. We are seeing um, that finance and investing is less about binary outcomes and there's, there's a greater amount of interconnectedness and interdisciplinary um, moves happening between geographies, economies, asset classes, how they, build, how they behave. We're also seeing new things that we've never seen before where you've got um, the retail revolution through Reddit now really dictating terms in terms of you know, how certain asset classes can go up or down or you know, how they behave. So, these are there are there are no there are no fundamental answers to this, but you know it's it's great to have the um, the building blocks of knowledge to be able to put some of these mar broader market moves in greater context. Look, and 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 um, finally, um, in my role right now as leading an end-to-end -end business, um, running a PNL, um, I found the corporate finance module, um, which was um, which was a really fantastic addition to. Um, to really understand, you know, how to build um, build a balance sheet, a cash flow statement from from scratch. The reality is, I'm not going to have to build it in my role. There's always our finance teams who will do that. But to be able to understand the most important aspect of how to allocate in my new role as a as a as as a head of a business, the only two things that matter are how we allocate resources and how we manage capital. So, you know, the corporate finance model really put me in good stead. To be able to to do that, but these are just some of the examples of um, some some phenomenal learnings from the master's course. 
but I would um, I would say the fundamentally the most important things is it's not given me the answers to everything, but it's really equipped me well to um, to ask the right questions. I'll, I'll just end with a with a thought, and maybe this is something for you as you embark on this journey. Uh, I was very fortunate at Vanguard in about 2017 to um, meet with Vanguard's founder Jack Bogle in the U.S. Um, you know. And it's not just because he was very willing to meet most people. I had 90 minutes with him and outside of my wife, he's one of the most impressive people I've ever met. And uh, the one thing I remember, and there's, um, um, there's a lesson here is, he made me feel like I was the most important and I was the smartest person in the room and I wasn't. And, uh, and that was just his greatness. So as um, I, I keep telling my teams, um, even at Vanguard and other places that, hey, it's not about how smart you are. It's um, you need to be able to learn and be confident, but you also need to have some modesty and skill in terms of being able to articulate what you're thinking um, to, to those around you. And I think the master's course over time coupled with um, some um, practical applied knowledge has really helped me sort of get to that. I'll never be um, at the point where Jack Bogle was, but um, you know, it's given me something to aspire to. I'll pause there and I'll um, take any questions. Back to you, Lindsay. Thank you very much, Balaji. That is fantastic. And um, I'm sure your wife appreciates that you consider her above Jack Bogle, so that's good. Um, uh, okay, now's the time for questions. Um, please feel free, pop them in the chat or pop your hand up if you have a question. You feel free to ask questions for Marcus and Guy as well. Um, and I, I would just say, while you're thinking of those fantastic questions, you know, Balaji raised a very good point about how long it takes to complete the master's. So if you are doing the master's from start to finish, it is three years part-time. If you uh, have a finance degree, it is two years part-time. Um, if you're doing the graduate diploma in, in um, applied finance, then equally, if you have a finance degree, it is one year. So there are four terms. You do a unit of term as a part-time um, student. You can go full-time if you like. Um, we certainly don't recommend it if you're working because it is a massive it's a massive commitment of time so um, that was just you know something that I thought was worth mentioning um, just in case uh, anyone is thinking geez I'd like to do this full time think very carefully okay um, any questions for um, for Marcus or Guy or myself or Balaji um, I can't see any hands no nothing in the chat okay um, well, obviously, we have answered all the questions that everyone has at this point, but of course, there was, a question, there, was, oh, sorry. there was a question from Pavel, which we haven't answered, which was to do with the, um, and it's for Marcus, US average time for private company to go public is uh, 10 to 12 years, and Australia apparently is six years, according to Pavel. How does, um, does that difference in, in time affect the decisions to invest? Well, there's some very interesting things going on in the public markets where over the last period, there are actually a lot less companies that are public than there used to be. And uh, a lot more companies actually being held in the private markets. And you can see that particularly with uh, one of our past portfolio companies, Airbnb. So in the past, it would have been public, but actually it's still growing private because there's more capital available for it nowadays. Australia is a really interesting market because it actually has uh, one of the most open public markets. And you'll actually see um, an ability for particularly here, small companies to be able to go um, public versus the rest of the world. Back to you, Lindsay. Thanks, Marcus. Thank you, Guy. Um, and we have had another question um, that is talking about when is the next intake. The next intake is now. Term two uh, starts at the beginning of April. We are taking applications now, and uh, you have a little while before the cutoff date, but um, I would, if you are interested in making an application, now is the time to do that. We have provided um, every, everyone with the, uh, the links um, to more consultations. If you want to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with me, I'm happy to go through any, um, uh, any questions you might have in particular or to discuss your particular circumstances. Um, and um, the website that you went to to get to this, uh, to this um, web webinar is actually a good place to start and has all the details about application. The application process is online. 
Um, and the main thing that we require is we will need transcripts of your previous education. It's very important to us and to have obviously a CV. And it's also very useful for us to have your video, which explains your background and what you're looking to do. So um, all of those things can be done online, um, but it's a, a process that you wanna start early. So my suggestion is if you have any further questions, please book yourself into a personal consultation. I'm more than happy to speak to people. I have spoken to some of the people here already uh, during uh, the, the last few months. So um, please dial in um, or log into that site and book yourself a consultation. With that, I would like to thank everyone for coming along today. Thanks for your attendance. Thanks for your questions. Thank you to Guy, Marcus and Balaji for providing us with their, the benefits of their experience. And I look forward to hearing from each of you um, as you go through uh, trying to work out how to do this. Okay, thank you very much, everyone.